Everyone, welcome to this special CUBE conversation. We are here in the Palo Alto studios of the CUBE. I'm John Furrier, your host here with Rehan Jalil, former president and CEO of Elastica, here to talk about the People First Network and his approach and experiences in his entrepreneurial journey. Rehan, thanks for joining us. Thank today. you so much, thanks for inviting. So we were talking before we came on, um, you have a great entrepreneurial journey. It's a great podcast up on the mayfield.com website. Um, really a good story about what you've done. But you had a lot of um, different kind of experiences through your <coughs> progression and journey in entrepreneurship. You had some failures and some successes. Um, and certainly now with cloud security is hot, I'm sure you're probably going to go into another one. But what's it like right now for you? You just left Semantic. You're kind of out on your own. That's right. Are you clipping coupons? Going to go to the <laughs> beach and hang out? Are you working on a new startup? What's, what's happening? Yeah, I think it's, um, uh, there's, there's a lot to do. Um, frankly, for me, it's very important to actually understand some new problems that, that needs to be solved. Um, especially, there's so much changing with AI uh, and uh, all the intrusions as, you, as you're seeing that uh, that's and breaches that are going on. Uh, there are no new problems to solve, and that's where my head is. Um, I'm not going to take too much of a break. <laughs> I'm going to get going. Yeah, you seem eager to go. I mean, that's <laughs> that's most entrepreneurs do that. Um, talk about let's talk about some of the experiences you had. And one of the things we were we were talking in about four key my cameras that back in the old days when before internet broadband wireless was hot, you did a startup around WiMAX, which was early days of broadband wireless. That's right. And then you had some failures, that, successes, but didn't work out. Right. But then you had another wireless startup That's right. that was successful that became part of that 4G movement. Um, this is an example of being correct in the thesis but you picked the wrong door to go through. <laughs> Talk about that, that, that journey, because I think that time in history, this is around 2001, 2002, 2003 time frame. This was the internet was growing, wireless, we didn't have the phones we have now, obviously it's smartphone uh, in, in 2007, years later. That's right, yeah. This was pre-mobile boom. Exactly. This was the beginning of the shift to broadband, true broadband. Yeah. Now we see it everywhere, LTE, 5G's around the corner. This was a pivotal moment, but for you, you were as an entrepreneur, you had the right decision, broadband wireless, right. but the, it was shifting. Feels like cloud today, but I want to get into that journey. What, would, what did you learn? Yeah, I think they were two very different companies. Uh, the, the mission of the first company, which I joined as an employee, uh, the first company, which was to take the high-speed internet to the masses. Uh, in US and some developed world, um, they were DSL and cable kind of was coming up. But that infrastructure did not exist in the rest of the world, and the, the mission was that if we could take same level of high-speed connectivity and enable it for the rest of the world, it'd be really cool. And this is back in the day, mm -hmm. right? Um, so Thesis was right, um, and, and hence I joined that company. Um, and it was a lot of fun, I learned a lot. Um, but I think one thing you, you have to realize, even in those times, uh, to do a, such a massive project, and to go against some massive in incumbents which exist in, in those ecosystems, the differentiation has to be extremely high. And um, to create differentiation on the, the radio side of things is just very difficult. Uh, and I think so, and of course, at that time, uh, the economy uh, took a bad turn, and that company yeah. had, didn't have a, some significant big outcome. Uh, from that learning, I evolved the thesis that this technology uh, needs to go mobile. And this is again pre-iPhone times. It was Blackberry times. So if you were to go talk to investors and say, look, the world is going to look like when we will have internet in our pocket, the people would smile at you. It's like, what are you talking about, right? Mm -hmm. um, so even raising money for that was not easy. And that was my first mm -hmm. company that I started myself called Y Chorus. Um, and thesis there was that, what if you could have DSL type connectivity and literally all internet's power in your pocket? And, but the learnings from the first company were that if you go try to do that in uh, straight in the wireless side of things, in, uh, in a telco environment, yeah. the competition uh, is going to be significantly high. The scale, the presence, the market exactly. power they have. And the purchasing cycle, most important is the purchasing cycles. Um, people take time to, even if you come up with something really compelling, by the time it's going to be getting deployed, uh, somebody will catch up to you. I mean, just think about the time. This is this is the time for the folks watching. If you're younger or even older, like like my age, think about it. You didn't. I mean, to actually have a phone in the car and surfing the internet 
didn't exist. I mean, you could barely get email just through a lower lower latency and a lower bandwidth. That's right. Um, you know, internet tower. They didn't have the broadband. And so today we surf, watch movies in the car. So this was this was pre-broadband. So I remember the time <laughs> when we were testing one router. It's like, look, we're getting a ping back before right. we're driving down 101. It's like that was like a miracle. Now That's now right. it's standard. This is this is when big shifts happen, and a lot of people are comparing um, that kind of environment to what we're seeing with cloud computing now. You're seeing Amazon Web Services, you know, 26, 27 billion dollar run rate, growing right. at 47 percent a year. Google with great technology now entering in. Microsoft pivoting to cloud. Those are big players. That's right. And startups are now trying to figure out what you learned right. and how to, to to not get in the way, but also draft off the momentum. What's your view of this and what advice do you have for entrepreneurs that are out there? Because this is the number one question that I hear and I talk about with entrepreneurs either behind closed doors or on theCUBE. I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a blessing to have actually some infrastructure like that. But if you don't do it right, it could be a curse. Um, what I mean by that is that you have, you, you have to leverage something that is available to you um, and not trying to kind of reinvent, slight, do sl something slightly better. Um, so I think on the infrastructure side, you have to be very really thoughtful on where you could potentially play, uh, and where, frankly, some of the big big players like AWS and or Microsoft and perhaps Google um, is going to be basically wanting to actually play themselves in that area. However, having said that, but the ecosystem and the the layer of services that is made available is actually a big big blessing for startups because all the value creation is kind of moving up the chain, um, and if you leverage that then the cost of building startups and cost of doing new things is kind of gone down. So we, we did something very similar with uh, the Elastica, uh, which was all about security for the cloud, from the cloud. And if we didn't have that infrastructure la layer available, the amount of money that would have required would have been significantly higher. So the cloud gets you scaled up, leveled up quicker, yeah. faster go to market, more agile right. and dynamic. Right. And then you can wrap IP around those yeah, old tasks of provisioning <laughs> servers. There's pl plenty of um, uh, intellectual property that of course you can put on top of it, but in a verticalized fashion. Uh, at least for Elastica, it was very much kind of a vertical solution of security for the cloud and SaaS applications um, itself. Um, instead of trying to uh, redo your own servers and server stack and automation, I mean things that are available just make use of them. So you guys were successful with the cloud. Quite successful. And you sold that company to Symantec, what year was that? Actually, um, it was 2015, we sold it to Bluecoat. Oh, Bluecoat, okay, that was the Bluecoat. And the Bluecoat got acquired or, you know, by Symantec, but then Bluecoat management took over uh, Symantec. And that was very, so we had like two acquisitions back to back. That's nice, it's a good experience. So I want to, before we move on to some of the things I want that are uh, more personal, I want to get your take on an entrepreneurial dynamic that um, a lot of successful entrepreneurs take and I want to get your reaction to. Sure. Most entrepreneurs are very optimistic. You know, they see the opportunity recognition, they go for it, you know, they're persistent, but they're also in discovery mode to, to validate their thesis right. and, and always kind of self-aware. But there's always the fatal flaw out there that, that, that potentially could be there. We talked about broadband wireless, directionally correct, good concept, fatal flaw was the incumbents. Mm -hmm. How do you, in essence, debug a startup venture, venture architecture or venture plan? Because th if there's a fatal flaw in there, it's like a bug in software. <laughs> How as an entrepreneur do you debug that? I mean, in your, in your journey, as you had successes and you learned from some things that were um, uh, teachable moments for you, is there a debugging formula? <laughs> how, how would you react to that? How would you explain entrepreneurs? Because that's what they always are naturally doing. Where's yeah. the fatal flaw? Where's the fatal flaw? Yeah, I, I think, and it's I think extremely important. Um, so first, firstly, the intellectual honesty in setting your own direction is very important. You certainly have to have the aspiration to go do something and have the attitude to go do it. But at the same time, setting direction is the most important thing. Or Keep tuning the direction mm -hmm. over time is actually extremely important. Uh, and then there is no one answer. Uh, the key thing is that if you're going to be building something, you have to see if there's a, going to be a big market for it. That's the first thing. And then when you're going to get there, how the adoption is going to be there. Would you have an uh, advantage in adoption as compared to incumbents if they get there? So I think you have to have a thesis because you just can't always project the, uh, the right way, especially in the enterprise uh, side of things. And if you can actually crack that that code, and then if when you do offer this to the market, um, is it going to be easy to adopt, easy to uh, accept by the customers, and would it have some kind of a effect of 
quick movement. Uh, I think you have to have all those right. Um, and some trend, if it uh, kind of uh, gives you support, like when we built Elastica, there was thesis the cloud is going to take over. The SaaS is going to happen. That was a tailwind for you. So it was a tailwind. Yeah. So it happened, interestingly, at the times when we had the product. Same actually happened for Y Chorus, interestingly, where the thesis that the need of um, very high speed internet to a mobile device, this is pre-iPhone times, uh, would happen. And luckily, iPhone came, o came on in uh, around 2007 timeframe, and we had the product, which telcos would have needed, and the iPhone came along, and um, we ended up building one of the first 4G networks along with uh, Clearwire in, um, in uh, Southern California. Um, so I think all these things kind of have to line, line up. The, the market, big market timing, your strategic advantage, your acceptance, uh, all the these self things. Self-awareness is a great point. Also have, having versatility and having the skills to flex because to get all those things right, you're kind of juggling. Yeah. Have that persistence. Okay, I got to ask you about people first. What does people first mean to you? Um, at, at the end, I think, frankly, that is the core, core of, uh, of startups. And we've been kind of lucky within Elastica. Our main reason for success has been that um, the team that we ended up having and building over time, um, they not only had actually very good diverse skill set, uh, in because Elastica required a uh, very diverse skill set from networking to cloud to AI to all those, but the chemistry between the team was also uh, quite amazing. So I think if you understand that the not only the people in the company and the dynamics within them is going to be, which is going to uh, be required, uh, then you start paying attention to the culture that goes along with it, right? So the culture of, you know, um, you know, e the executing uh, as well as doing it with kindness and humility yeah. uh, along the way. Sharing the experience, the journey together, co-creating, kind of yeah. creating that super glue. That's right. And the culture. That's, That's right. super important. Extremely important. What have you learned in, in your over your um, journey around the where it's worked, where it hasn't? Because a lot of people are trying to figure out that people equation. I mean, it's it's people they really if they sincerely believe it, they want to they want to do it. And, but sometimes people don't know the playbook. Yeah. Is there a playbook? Is there a or people just go by their gut? What's your what's your advice on? You know, someone said, hey, you know, I really want to get my people equation right. I want to get that right. Um, we have a mission. Want to yeah. share that mission? What are some of the things that that, that entrepreneurs and, and companies can do? Like immediately that's easy to, to get going. I think being uh, is communication. Uh, and upfront, I think you to start communicating, not just in words, but in the things that you do yourself. Um, because it's not, words don't count. Mm -hmm. How you actually deal with people, and how you actually treat them, and how you actually collaborate, mm -hmm. um, actually really matters. And you have to set, set that, that actually is the driving force of actually setting a culture, uh, I would say, in place. Um, and then if you observe any, any things that are working out, communication yeah. is, a, is going to be the key. Uh, you openly communicate. Uh, and do it in a way that it's, is not a hostile environment. I love your history, I love your background. Uh, my personal family is, uh, is a family of immigrants that have come to the United States. You have a very immigrant story. Andy Grove was an immigrant, founder of Intel. I mean, Silicon Valley was born. Entrepreneurship is indiscriminate. Entrepreneurs yeah. are, 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 are who they are. Mm -hmm. But you have an interesting story where you came from, how you came to Silicon Valley. Tell that story. Yeah, so I was born in Pakistan. Um, my parents were uh, born in India, uh, so they migrated to Pakistan, and it just happens to be that I came here for studies. Um, I interestingly, I didn't know much about Silicon Valley, to be honest, um, and I happened to have a job in Sun Microsystems that happened to be in Silicon Valley, but when I came here, it was kind of a, kind of a, a blessing. This is exactly where I needed to be, um, because even at s when I was going to grad school, um, I had the aspiration to actually go do something uh, on my own, but I didn't know, don't, didn't know how. Um, and when you come here to Silicon Valley, you, the people around you and the friendship that you create here and the relations that you build here and what you learn from the other people is actually is quite amazing. Uh, so I feel very blessed. That it really, it it really is a special place and you have to kind of understand that vibe and culture. Mm -hmm. I, gotta, I want to ask you a personal question. A lot of entrepreneurs uh, think they can go to business school and get an entrepreneurship degree, and some do. Um, but I always have that debate. You're kind of born with it, it's kind of my philosophy. Some people might debate that. It's always a classic <laughs> debate. Are you born with it or can you learn it? Or both. 
Um, some people know they're entrepreneurs early young. Some figure it out, like me when I'm when in my 30s, is when I kind of figured out that I have that entrepreneurial talent right. looking back at some of the things I did. When did you find out that, that you knew that you were entrepreneurial and you wanted right. to build stuff on your own? You said, this is who I am as a person. What was that moment That's right. like? I think very early. I didn't have any doubt. Um, this was undergrad times. In, back in my undergrad school in Pakistan, um, I think I s knew that I'll be doing something on my own, and uh, that's exactly what I wanted to do. So how I would do it, what timeline is going to be, I didn't didn't know any of that. But I had this kind of uh, some belief in my mind that <coughs> that I was going to basically build some things and build business around it. So it was, it was quite early. And so you were lucky, got some time. And when you came to Silicon Valley, what were some of the things you did? Was it like a, oh my God, this is an amazing place, or did you have to do some networking? What were some of the things that you did when you first came in and to really kind of get into that groove swing, entrepreneurial groove swing? Um, this, is, this is one of those times when uh, Sun was is an amazing place. Um, I ended up at Sun Microsystems, um, and the people there were unbelievably talented. Yeah. Uh, they have all kinds of talented people there. So I think very entrepreneurial too, coming out of Stanford, Scott McNeely, all the early DNA in there was all very entrepreneurial. Exactly. Yeah. So I think that that was again uh, a place where you could learn a lot, not just in technology, but actually how to solve problems, how to understand customer uh, problems that you could solve and build new technology on top of it. So I think, and I didn't stay there that long. Within a couple of years, I decided that I need to go, basically join a small company where I could do more things. Um, beyond just you know designing one aspect or just I was building microprocessor designs um, instead of just doing that I could I could I do you know uh, other roles also so I joined uh, the Broadmoor Wireless company a part of that you mentioned yeah as an entrepreneur um, one of the big decisions is who you're going to marry in terms of a VC or partner financial partner that's right uh, it truly is taking on a new partnership and um, that's a big struggle, and, and I think we've seen the bro grammar culture certainly uh, amplified it just recently in the past decade where you know, everyone wants to go for the big valuations. Right. And they go, oh, wow, look at I only sold 15% of my company and raised 10 million or a big number. Look how great that is. But then you realize that when they come to board meetings, <laughs> you know, you got them a good valuation, but they're going to want them, may not be receptive on the other side. So there's a dynamic in fundraising sure. early on, um, not just market selection as a venture but partner selection. Talk about how important that is, how you handled it, and advice for people thinking about selection of a uh, financial partner. Yeah. So you see, in, in technology companies, where you have to invest a bunch in R&D early on, you do need money. It's just, uh, just the way it works. Um, so, but money is not everything, uh, because right now, at least today, uh, money is kind of commodity. You can actually raise from many, many different um, sources, many different VCs. Um, but one thing I've learned within the startups is that a start all, any and all startups will have good times and bad times. Uh, will have doubts in the strategy and will have conviction. And when those times are not so good, you need people who you can just go talk frankly without worrying about it and uh, without getting judged along the way. Trust. Trust, trust is, the, is the key. So I think you pick people essentially based on how much you actually trust them, especially very, very early stage startups. And then as you go, go along, perhaps things change over time, because over time, if the company's scaling, you may need a lot more money. But I think, uh, again, people first. Uh, you, you want to partner with people you can actually trust. And that hard conversation sometimes you want to have, you want to be self-aware, and that's always step one. But two, vulnerability, and then yeah. partnering with a financial partner that's going to sit on the same side of the table at the that's right, right times, that's right, and maybe on the other side to be a counterbalance at yeah. the right times, mm -hmm. and also when you need more money, they got to help you sell the next round too. There's a lot that's of right. there's a lot of things that they that you that they have to do. That's right, and the dynamic is critical. Yeah, absolutely, right. and you and you've had success with that. So far, it's been a success. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's the big thing happening right now in your mind? Just to kind of take it forward now as we look forward, you see a lot of cloud computing. You've got a great experience with cloud. You've been successful. Cloud security is really hot. Yeah. Um, what do you see as opportunities in the cloud space as now that you got your entrepreneurial, you know, 20 mile stare out there looking for opportunities? Um, I'm sure you probably be more security space, but in general for, as an entrepreneur, what do you see as um, things that people can go after, markets? In general, I say on the enterprise side of things, anything that uh, simplifies work and automates it, whether using AI and whether using, you know, other technologies, software technologies, I think that's where it's going to go more because horizontal layers, 
where you have big data platforms and you have infrastructure providers. Um, I think they are doing a great job in enabling the ecosystem, but now we're going to see a lot more verticalized uh, solutions built based on machine learning and AI and automation. I think that's, we're going to see a lot more. There's plenty of opportunity. It's super there. early too, in your Very early. Agree, do you agree with that? Absolutely, yeah. Great, well thanks for coming on theCUBE Conversation. Appreciate it, it's part of the Mayfield People First uh, Conversations. I'm John Furrier with theCUBE. We are Rian Jalil, Jalil, former president and CEO of Elastica, a successful serial entrepreneur about to embark on his next adventure. Good luck and looking forward to catching up. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting. Thanks for watching. Yeah. This is theCUBE Conversation People First Network. I'm John Furrier.